We moved here 14 months ago after living for four years in the quiet little town of Three Hills, Alberta, where I taught Old Testament at Prairie College. For those of you whose Canadian geography is rusty, that's north of Montana, which we've already heard about this morning. And it's about a 28 hour drive northeast of here. Our town, get this, had fewer residents than there are listening to the sound of my voice right now. And our college had fewer students than Biola has faculty. So, this has been quite a change for me. <laughs> we were surrounded by wheat and canola fields and the closest Walmart was a 45 minute drive away. Frankly, I'm still in a little bit of culture shock. <laughs> Did I take this job because the weather is nicer here? Nope. <laughs> I actually like winter. Was it, was it the money? Okay, true, they do pay me more here at Biola. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> we went from a 2,400 square foot house down to a 1,700 square foot house that was three times the cost. So, I'm not sure we came out ahead. Did I take this job because I was tired of small town life? Also, nope although it is nice having Trader Joe's just down the road. I, I'll be honest. We loved living in a small town. Did this put us closer to family? Double nope. We're actually no closer to our families in Oregon and in Colorado than we were in Alberta. A bigger school is not necessarily better. It just means Sorry, Dr. Corey can confirm this for you. It just means that all the problems are 20 times more expensive to solve. And there's a lot more paperwork to fill out. More of you mean I have more assignments to grade. So why did we come? We were responding to a sense of calling. My husband Daniel and I have endeavored to serve God wherever and however he calls us. We're in the process of working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Not in the sense that we earn our way to heaven, but that we recognize we are not our own. Our lives belong to God. It is he who works in us, both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Those are the purposes that matter. A big draw for me in coming to Biola was the chance to disciple students in the shadow of Disneyland. Not so that we could go there, although we have made our pilgrimage and we've had our fun, but because Los Angeles is in many ways the center of the entertainment industry. Did you know you can hop in a car, drive for an hour, and show up on the set of America's Got Talent this Saturday? Did you know that last month you could have gone to hear John Williams conduct a symphony in person where they were playing the music that he wrote for Star Wars, which I have actually seen? <laughs> Once, <laughs> like a really long time ago. <laughs> you can do your internship at Warner Brothers, you can do a you can get involved in a church that's just down the street in Hollywood. I believe with Abraham Kuyper that there is no square inch on this entire planet over which the Spirit of Christ does not cry out, mine. This city, this city that churns out the content that tells the rest of the world how and what to think and what to love, this too belongs to God. Christians need to be here, thoughtfully engaging the culture, creating in a way that stirs our souls and cultivates human flourishing. So here we are. And not only do we shape our context, but our context shapes us. The communities where we belong shape what we love. How is this community, this city, shaping what you love? 
here we are in La Mirada, along with 12 and a half million other residents of the greater Los Angeles area, just 20 minutes from Disneyland. On any given day, somewhere between 80,000 and 135,000 people descend on Disneyland from all over the world expecting to have the time of their lives. And every night, right here in La Mirada, we can hear the fireworks that put the finishing touches on visitors' experience in the happiest place on Earth. What sort of gravitational pull does this place exert on us? Fog machines, lights, a stage. How is it shaping the way we think about the world? How is it changing us? I want to consider two dimensions of Disney. First, the medium, and then the message. 17 years ago, our family drove down from Oregon to Disneyland with our two daughters. Our oldest was five, and our younger daughter was less than two months old. We were on the Tom Sawyer Riverboat cruise, and it was time to nurse the baby, so I was looking for a quiet, private place to sit, and I found these benches that were like on the interior of the ship, and I thought, oh, I'll just go there and feed the baby, and we'll be on our way. Well, imagine my surprise when I turned into this little area and there was a little boy, four years old, draped across the benches, looking abominably bored. And I said, what are you doing? Didn't you know the view's out there? Like, you could go see the island. His grandma was sitting right beside him. She says, oh, we come here every Wednesday. He's seen it all already. I was floored. What does it do to a child's development to hang out at the happiest place on earth every Wednesday? <laughs> at four years old, it had already lost its sparkle. Some of us live for entertainment. We treat, it like, we treat life like it should offer us non-stop stimulation. And when it doesn't, we're easily bored. Have you ever known someone whose sole purpose is to get away on weekends? Work holds no particular value or meaning for them other than to fund vacation. And since every weekend is spent in this pursuit, there's little time for church. Entertainment becomes their mission in life. Here's the thing, though, about entertainment. It's not meant to be an end in itself. On its own, vacation is empty. God designed rest to refresh and re refuel us for the work that he designed us to do, not the other way around. To put vacation at the center is to ask for emptiness. Sooner or later, we'll wind up on the cushioned benches of the riverboat crews, bored out of our minds. We aren't wired to play nonstop. When the rhythm of work and rest gets reversed or off balance, we can expect to struggle with angst and wonder why we never feel satisfied. Maybe some of you are there right now. Now, some of you may be called by God to work in the entertainment industry. You'll create music or films or design roller coasters or even become Imagineers at Disney. I believe that you can honor God with that work and find deep fulfillment. To create on behalf of and for the sake of others is meaningful work. But if you flip that around, and make it the goal of your life to seek entertainment for yourself, you'll find life to be rather empty. In 1985, Neil Postman issued a sober warning about the state of the American public discourse in his book, which was ominously titled, Amusing Ourselves to Death. The book came out before the average family owned a computer and before we could imagine how the internet would revolutionize the way we engage with each other and with the world. Postman insisted that 
every technology has an inherent bias. His concern was to highlight what we lose when television replaces books and newspapers as the medium for public discourse. He explains, what I'm claiming here is not that television is entertaining, duh, but that it has made entertainment itself the natural format for the representation of all experience. News, politics, marketing, even education. In other words, Postman pointed out, television is our culture's principal mode of knowing about itself. The medium shapes the message. And the medium, medium of television, visual stimulation, shifted the way we interact with each other and communicate ideas. Postman says it even affects the ideas we're able to have. It shapes not just how, but what we think. Postman could not have known then that today I'd be addressing a crowd of young people who are all carrying around tiny televisions in their pockets. Who, who would have thought that the forms of entertainment pioneered for TV would be adapted to shorter and shorter clips made by anyone, anywhere, even me? By the way, I do have a YouTube channel. You should go ahead and subscribe. <laughs> And, and accessed on demand by anyone, anywhere, individually. But honestly, I doubt he'd be all that surprised. This is the logical outcome of the appetites stoked by the medium of television. And he was absolutely right that complex ideas in print form would lose their power because, as he put it, People will come to love their oppression, to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. People will come to love their oppression, to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. Is that what's happening? Are we trading away our capacity to think for the convenience of pocket entertainment? That's a dark way to start a conference. So let me end this introduction with a note of hope. Postman also said that no medium is excessively dangerous if its users understand what its dangers are. So let the viewer understand. Disney is not the problem. Your phone is not the problem either. We are the problem. The problem is user error. Like a toddler who thinks he'd be happiest if mom would let him live on candy, we enjoy entertainment and uncritically move it to center stage of our lives, and then we're left wondering why we feel oddly unsatisfied. We've inadvertently allowed this medium to reshape our loves, and some of us are starving to death as a result. Finding our way back to spiritual health will involve examining more closely the messages we've absorbed through this medium of entertainment. Disney's medium is movies and music and theme parks. What message does Disney convey through this medium? Disney, of course, is known for the stories that it tells. Obviously, every Disney movie is a story, but even the rides at Disneyland are storied. On the Peter Pan ride, you climb into a ship and make your way through the scenes of the story. You start in the children's bedroom, and then you fly out over London, past the clock tower, and into the starry night. After a while, you can see Neverland down below, and then you zoom down and see Peter Pan fight Captain Hook to save Tiger Lily and Wendy and the Lost Boys, and then you fly back to the bedroom, and the ride is over. To enter the Peter Pan ride, 
is to enter the story. And while Disney movies tell stories with a variety of characters and settings, they honestly all have the same basic message. Here we go. You are enough. And when you face obstacles, if you just follow your heart, it will all turn out happily ever after. Right? <laughs> it is a problem. The Little Mermaid really wants to go on land. Following her heart takes her there, even though it's defying her father and she loses her voice in the process. In the end, she gets what she wants and lives happily ever after, separated from her family and her community of origin. In The Lion King, <laughs> Simba doesn't, think, Simba doesn't think he's fit to be king, but eventually he discovers he has what it takes, and so he returns to Pride Rock following his heart, where he defeats his uncle Scar and becomes king. In Encanto, Mirabelle is the only member of the Madrigal family without a miraculous gift. But when her family's legacy is in danger, what does she do? She reaches within herself for the strength to heal her family. Now, I'm as much a fan of Disney as all of you. I enjoy the movies, I listen to the songs, I even like Disneyland, it's quite impressive. But have you noticed that this scenario doesn't always work out in real life? We often do not have what it takes. The resources we need are not within us, but in our communities and in God. Following our heart can get us in a heap of trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even villains follow their hearts in Disney movies, right? Right? Jafar wants power and grabs for it. Maleficent wants to be invited. Hopper wants food without working for it. When we turn within ourselves to find the resources we need, we end up divided from each other and from God. And sometimes we do all the right things and still end up in a world of hurt. Our lives are not happily ever after. They are messy and complicated. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul lays out a very different storyline as a framework for understanding how the world works. And if we're going to find our way in the shadow of Disneyland, then we need to consider his story. Paul says, knowing Christ is enough. All else is worthless in comparison. He exhorts us to be found in Christ so that his righteousness becomes ours. And then he says, when we participate in Christ's sufferings, we experience resurrection. I think it's important for us to interrogate our own way of seeing the world to discern whether we're living according to Disney's plot line or Paul's. Let's see if I can lay bare the story that got most of you to Biola. I don't know all of you personally, so I'm just guessing here, but does it go something like this? Get good grades in high school. Why? So that you can get into a good four-year college, like Biola, right? Then you get a good internship, and why do you need a good internship? So that you can land a good career. And how do you do these things? Well, you Follow your heart because you can be whatever you want. But why? Why do we do this? What is this all about for you? What are you shooting for? Now, don't get me wrong, Biola is a good choice. You have chosen well. You wanted a Christian school where you could grow in your understanding of the Christian faith, where you could come to conferences like this one and be challenged. It's a great step on the way of knowing Jesus. But many of us, without realizing it, have smuggled into Biola the same storyline the world is peddling. And if the Disney storyline is in the shadows behind your get to Biola plan, 
then this storyline leaves you constantly wondering, am I enough? Do I have what it takes? And since the key is to follow your heart, you feel a tremendous pressure to figure out what your heart's saying. What should you be? What should your major be? Many of us have been treating Jesus like he's a guest performer on our show instead of the director or producer. We navigate life as if God is here to make things go more smoothly for us as we're trying to follow our heart to reach our personal dreams. Let me be more specific. One of last year's graduates of Biola University told me he didn't care what he did after graduation as long as it paid six figures. Is that what this is about? Is that why we're here? It doesn't matter what you do as long as there's money in it? Or is it about self-actualization, becoming the best version of ourselves? The story we tell ourselves about what it is we're doing shapes and defines our journey. This year's Tory conference, as we've already heard, is centered around a big idea, the way. And we're considering three avenues of spiritual growth that all start with S, story, spiritual practices, and suffering. So, so far, I've been talking about the story we tell about our lives, including both the medium and the message of that story, and how it shapes and defines our journey. Our story tells us what we're aiming for. Maybe you feel a bit aimless, you aren't sure what to shoot for. If that's you, I'm giving a workshop in both breakout sessions this afternoon on discovering what you were born to do. I'd love to see you there. But even if we're aimless, our habits or spiritual practices, to use the S word, determine where we end up. And that's what I want to talk about now. Where will you be in five years if you keep on doing what you're doing right now? Every choice we make is a building block for the future. What are we building, little by little? Every five dollars we spend, every meal we choose to eat, every 15 minutes we invest, whether that's in exercise or study or Netflix or video games or attention to detail or creativity, it all adds up. Who am I gradually becoming? Jewish rabbi Ari Lam recently talked on a podcast about the high point of biblical revelation is ritual. Mundane practices that position us to relate to God. If you've taken my Old Testament class, which hundreds of you have, then you've heard me talk about this. The Torah is the foundation of Israel's scriptures and the entire thing is a giant literary sandwich. Genesis and Deuteronomy are the bookends, or the bread of the sandwich. Exodus is the trip to Sinai. Numbers is the trip away from Sinai. And at the very center of it all, the center of the most foundational book of the Christian faith and the Jewish faith is Leviticus, a collection of rituals and laws. Leviticus itself is a chiasm with the Day of Atonement at its center. And the genius of this book is not pyrotechnics, but sacrifices and laws, daily investments in the development of virtue, daily commitments to, shall we say, work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it is God who works in us. Daily and weekly rituals are powerful means of shaping us. We've already considered the little boy who spends every Wednesday at Disneyland. That's his weekly ritual. What are our rituals? When we moved to La Mirada last summer, my husband and I began looking in earnest for a house. And our hope was to live within walking distance of campus. 
This is simply because I don't like traffic, and there's a lot of that in Los Angeles. Um, but I've also been told that the best all-around form of exercise is walking, and that 30 minutes of walking a day will keep away cancer and heart disease and all sorts of other maladies. And so we looked, and by God's grace, we found a house, just a 15-minute walk from Talbot East, where my office is. Now, walking to work once will not transform my health. But if we're planning to be here for the long haul, which we are, you're stuck with me, <laughs> what, if I maintain the habit of walking every day or even most days for the next 20 years, what will that do to me? What will that mean for my health? Our habits add up, whether good or bad. Maybe walking to Biola is not an option for you. How could you turn your commute into a time investment that will pay dividends going forward? Could it be a focused time of prayer, of worship? Could it be a time of learning through podcasts or audiobooks? What daily practice can add up to spiritual growth for you? I like to think of spiritual habits or practices like showering. It doesn't work to keep putting it off until the next day, does it? You can't say on October 1st, you know, I just want to really get clean. I'm going to shower for two hours today so that I don't have to shower for the rest of the month. <laughs> At least your roommate is not going to appreciate that method of hygiene. Similarly, you can't brush your teeth for 10 minutes straight on Sunday and expect to have fresh breath for the rest of the week. Brushing has to happen daily, preferably twice daily. You are brushing your teeth, aren't you? Even though your mom is not here to remind you, <laughs> consider this your friendly reminder. <laughs> if a month goes by and you haven't connected with God, there's no way to make up for what you missed by doing a whole bunch of spiritual practices all at once. Each day is its own unique opportunity, and once that day is gone, it's never coming back. We don't have yesterday. We, we don't even have tomorrow. All we have is today. At the same time, it doesn't help for us to wallow in regret about missed opportunities. Although it may take time to develop regular habits that are good, no matter how far we've wandered from communion with God, it's only always one step to, to come back to Him. That's grace. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You, today you can choose where this whole thing is headed. James K.A. Smith writes about the power of habit in his book, You Are What You Love. He says, the first, last, and most fundamental question of Christian discipleship is, what do you want? Our desires propel us along life's path, informing our actions that become habits. And those habits shape who we become. What do you want? And who are you becoming? Do you want to know God? Then certain spiritual practices will facilitate that. Spiritual practices like prayer, like worship, solitude, fasting, hospitality, Sabbath rest, self-examination. They're not magic. They don't automatically guarantee spiritual maturity. And we don't do them to win brownie points with God or earn his favor. However, as Ruth Haley Barton puts it, we can, with these spiritual practices, create the conditions in which spiritual transformation can take place. By developing and maintaining a rhythm of spiritual practices that keep us open and available to God. Doesn't that sound refreshing? A life of openness and availability to God? Barton encourages us to begin this journey by learning to pay attention to our desire in God's presence. 
Until we've named those desires in God's presence, we're not yet ready for change because we haven't even admitted to ourselves who we are. Now, it might seem surprising to you that I would ask you to pay attention to your desires. Doesn't that just land us right back where we started in a self-indulgent mess? No, the difference here is naming your desires in God's presence because our openness to the Spirit's work changes the equation. Rather than self-indulgence, we engage in self-examination. As Psalm 37 verse four says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. This is not saying, have your daily quiet time so you can get what you want. Federico Villanueva notes, as we delight in the Lord and in his word, the desires of our heart become in tune with what God desires. We live in a sin-sick world. Our hearts are oriented to things that are not good for us. If you've ever worked with kids or you have younger siblings or cousins, then you know how this goes. Little kids never want to go to bed. They always wanna stay up late. That's what they really want. But adults realize that their bodies need sleep to function well. That's why we say no. We don't want tomorrow to be spoiled by lack of sleep. I don't know how many of you need a reminder today that's, yeah, okay. We've already been over that. Children need caregivers because kids don't naturally know what is best for them. When we spend time in God's presence, our divine caregiver, our values are reshaped. We begin to understand and to want what is truly good. Paul's prayer for the Philippians is that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Do you hear that? Paul cares about what they love. He wants that love to mature as they come to know what is truly best. Buddhism's goal is to eliminate all desire. Hedonism's goal is to indulge all desire. Paul's vision is to see our desires mature so that we love what is best. God's invitation to us is to be with him in prayer or in silence, in worship or in the word, in solitude or in community, and in God's presence to open up our hearts we're invited to stop hiding from ourselves and from God. This habit of honesty in God's presence will shape our stories as we learn to follow Jesus. The third dimension of our conference this week after story and spiritual practices is suffering. And suffering is another avenue that can either propel us towards spiritual growth or pull us off course. The stories we tell ourselves and the spiritual practices we engage in determine how we view suffering and how we respond to it. What is happening when things go wrong? To what do we attribute our trials? How does suffering play into the Disney storyline? How does suffering play into your storyline? How does suffering play into Paul's storyline? For the Disney character, suffering is an obstacle to overcome so they can get what they want. What story do you tell yourself when things don't go the way you planned? That it's your fault? That it's Satan's attack? That God doesn't love you? This is where we need Paul, and we need to, closer, to take a closer look at how Paul talks about suffering. For Paul, suffering is an opportunity to participate with Christ's sufferings, looking ahead to the resurrection, 
Tomorrow evening, we'll talk more about that. We'll track Paul's storyline of suffering to see how he reframes suffering as the path to glory. We don't talk about this enough. How many of us knew when we surrendered our lives to Jesus that we were supposed to take up our crosses and follow him? Or did we see Jesus as the ticket to a smoother life and a brighter future? We're not doing people any favors when we market Christianity as an easier path. It isn't. It involves putting to death our disordered desires and making ourselves available to do the will of God, even when that involves hardship. When Mary agreed to bear the Son of God, she knew it would not be easy, and she followed Jesus all the way to the cross. When Paul encountered Jesus, he was told he was entering a path of suffering. When Moses reluctantly agreed to return to Egypt to participate in God's rescue mission, he knew he was signing up for trouble. When Isaiah volunteered to bring God's message to his generation, God explicitly told him he would not succeed. They would not listen. Jeremiah and Ezekiel have similar stories to tell. They were hated mocked and rejected. For these followers of Yahweh, suffering was part of the package. Their stories would not play very well on a Disney stage. None of them were enough on their own. None of them followed their hearts. Instead, they surrendered their will to the will of God and encountered suffering, imprisonment, rejection, mockery, and death their stories would make an odd matinee. Plenty of excitement and adventure, but none of the happily ever after we've been trained to look for. I can see it now, the Jeremiah ride at Disneyland. You hop in a chariot, maybe, and you move through the scenes of his life. Scene one is God calling Jeremiah in utero. Scenes two, three, and four are Jeremiah weeping. Scene five involves a fair bit of yelling. Scene six is Baruch writing it all down. And scene seven is the king burning the scroll while Jeremiah is thrown in a cistern. And then the ride is over. Or how about a Paul ride? They could use the ships from the Peter Pan ride. and. and as Paul goes to kill Christians, and then he encounters the risen Lord who blinds him and tells him he's going to suffer. And so then he goes from place to place getting beaten and tortured and imprisoned, chased out of town. The ride ends as Paul is in his prison cell writing a letter to his friends back home, telling them to count it all joy. Is that the happy ending Disney is looking for? What a strange world we have entered when we follow Jesus. It's never been about seeking success. As Walter Brueggemann said, the reconciling, emancipatory, transformative work of Jesus is a way of life that's propelled not by results, but by faithfulness. It's always been about seeking to be faithful, seeking to know Christ, and become like Christ. That's all that matters. The happily ever after comes later, when Christ returns and we are resurrected to reign with him. This life holds no promise of success. In 2002, my husband and I were living as missionaries in the Philippines. We had sold most of our things, left our families, said our goodbyes, traversed the globe, and were immersed in learning a new language and culture. Our goal was to reach Filipino Muslims with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Partway into our time there, I received an email from, the co- from a professor at the college where I had attended. He was program director of biblical languages, and the email asked me to list my accomplishments since graduation. I hadn't earned a graduate degree, hadn't written any books, had barely even taught Sunday school by this point, and most pertinently to this particular request, I had forgotten all the Greek and Hebrew I had ever learned. I was trying to learn Filipino. So what was I to say? Did I have any success to report? 
I finally answered by saying that my single greatest accomplishment in life was that Muslim street vendors in Quezon City, Metro Manila, who lived on less than a dollar a day, invited me into their homes. Perched on land they did not own, built with, scra built with scraps of corrugated metal in which they slept on the floor, the whole family in one room. That one room was their kitchen, their living room, and their bedroom. They had only one book, the Quran, which they could not read, and only one piece of furniture, a table, to hold their TV. They had no fridge. These dear people let the American lady with a college degree climb to the third floor of the concrete building on top of which they had erected their shanty. A flat roof with no railing where they were having babies and raising kids. They let me hold their babies and pray for them in my halting Tagalog. This one, who has a TV and a stereo, cried when I said I was moving back to America. And that, my friends, is the most important work I have ever done. I have two more degrees now, and my fifth book will soon be published. This is the fourth institution where I've served as professor. I've spoken at conferences, earned awards, received accolades, but my answer to that email would not change. Because sitting barefoot on that linoleum floor with rainwater seeping up through the holes and getting my butt wet taught me something about Christ. It showed me that I can find him far from the stage lights and the halls of power, far outside my comfort zone. Christ was right there with me. Friends, I didn't know what I was doing. I was making it up as I went along, just trying to show up, spend time with people, and love them well. To be honest, I didn't feel him there. At the time, God felt hidden, silent. But I see now, in retrospect, that I was looking for him in all the right places, in the slums, among the poor, at the open market, he was there in disguise. He's with me here too, and wherever I seek to be attentive to his leading, I said yes to this invitation because I sensed that the Lord was in it, but this moment is likely no more significant than that one on the rooftop in Manila. That was a hard season for me spiritually. God felt silent, I felt lost, I wondered why we'd come and I doubted if we were making any difference. By the time we left, none of the 80 friends, Muslim friends that I knew had embraced Jesus as their savior. We wondered why we had taken the trouble to go. But in retrospect, those two and a half years in the Philippines profoundly shaped my idea about what it means to be a Christian. It's not about the feelings. It's not about success stories. It's about recognizing our deep dependence on a God we cannot see. It's about showing up and being faithful, even when we don't see any results. Even more than that, those years awakened in me a longing to know God and to be in his presence. That longing overpowered me even when God felt absent, because God felt absent, that crucible of isolation reformed my desires. Remember, we are what we want. And that season of suffering shaped me because it burned away lesser desires and helped me want one thing above all, the presence of God. I've experienced other seasons of suffering since then, some of them far more difficult, but that season in the Philippines prepared me in important ways for other hard seasons. It taught me that God has gifts to give us that can only come wrapped in suffering. And that some of those gifts are not evident until many years later. 
the greatest gift of all is the gift of his presence. You and I have a natural impulse to avoid suffering or to choose the path of least resistance. Paul sees things differently. He recognizes that suffering is part of what we signed up for. He writes, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. How's that for a word of encouragement? He's not looking for success in the eyes of the world, but gospel partnership. He praises God that they stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. The good news that points to knowing Christ and being found in him as the chief goal of life. To find our way in the shadow of Disneyland, we must reframe our stories, our spiritual practices, and our suffering so that they orient us toward that end, knowing Jesus. My prayer for you is that this conference awakens in you a deep desire to know Christ. That Jesus would not just be our sidekick, but that we would be his. And that we would have the courage to follow him wherever he leads. I followed Jesus from the jungles of South Central America to the slums of Metro Manila and from the prairies of Canada to the shadow of Disneyland. I can tell you from experience that it will not be easy. And you might not experience any success, but it will be well worth the risk. Because no matter what the result, we will find more of God. And what more could we possibly want? Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.